be deliberately provocative. And uh, I'm going to start by, you know, actually the thing was started yesterday. I think we shut this up here. Yeah, I'm not using the mic. I think the sound system needs to be Somebody did something. Yeah. Maybe just put it off. We so don't need it actually. We are all loud mouthed people. I think that mic needs to be shut off. Mm -hmm. But I think it's probably also got to do with the system okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so yesterday, uh, Mr. Ayer began by his keynote by arguing that he's uncomfortable with planning, and so am I. <clears throat> and what I'm going to be talking about, and I'm uncomfortable with the word mainstreaming, and I'm uncomfortable with another word, and I've been using Mr. Ayer's uh, presentation of st stakeholders. You know. He's argued very effectively somewhere, I think, long ago, when he said you don't believe in stakeholders, but either stake winners or stake losers. And by using the word stakeholders, we sort of sanitize the politics, we pretend as if it doesn't exist, and put the village landlord and the village landless in the same room and you know, say you've got a stakeholder meeting, and try to legitimize decisions based on that. Now, this is where words matter, uh, and it's important to, for us to deconstruct these words. You know, my problem with uh, uh, what I really hope to do, now this picture, I, I just want to put that picture up for a simple reason. Because I do what I call towards eye science. I believe there are two types of sciences. You know, we're all taught that there's only one science, like Vedanta, you know, monistic, you know, and all that. No, that's not true. Uh, there are many types of sciences, and the way I classify them, uh, you have a towards eye science, where your viewpoint and perspective starts from down there, and you have an eagle's eye science, you know, you know floating up there, satellite mapping and GIS and just about everything else. And people think that they can sit in a room like they do in somewhere in Nevada and guide these drones to attack places in Pakistan. Uh, you can actually play computer games. Now, we feel that that's maybe the high science is necessary, yes it is. Uh, it is useful if properly used, but it's certainly not sufficient. And especially the towards eye view has been missing, which it has in many cases of development and cases of water resource in particular, then there is severe distortion in the way things move. And in this basin business, it's even more apparent. I mean, we put up a map like the Ganga Brahmaputra Basin there, you know, Meghna, and we think we have an idea of the whole thing. Look at a micro basin anywhere in one of those basins, and you'll find 200 problems there, each more intractable than the next. And they have to be solved ultimately down there. It's not going to be solved by a satellite. They may help to a certain extent. But unfortunately, they have over tools have overtaken our, uh, you know, policy making. Uh, mainstreaming. I mean, we talked yesterday about that reverse tree of uh, leaves actually being more important than the trunk. Uh, I think that's the whole idea here. That it's not so much mainstreaming as unstreaming or tributaring or whatever. In invent a word, please. You know. But the idea is that there are many, many different types of activities, thinking, conceptions, viewpoints. Uh, aspirations that are out there that are getting smothered by this idea of this single monistic one big national plan case. Now, one of the uh, uh, issues, uh, you know, remember, uh, I'll also be talking, because this is transboundary, and I'm coming with a very, very local kind of a perspective, it might seem like a contradiction, but I'd like to start with this Hillary Clinton's famous or notorious speech <coughs> the other day, here in Madras, I believe, where she said, if India wants to be a superpower, India has to learn to, you know, get along with his neighbor and take his neighborhood along with it. And that indeed has been a problem at global level with India trying to get the Security Council seat or whatever. And everybody points back and says, listen, you don't have good relations with any of you. you know, how do you expect to, you know, take up that role? And then when these diplomats, whether they're Chinese or Western or European, Americans, whatever, come to a place like Nepal or Bangladesh, they hear all kinds of stories then, you know. And then they go back reinforced in their all views. <clears throat> now, the problem here is, uh, this is why it's important and nowhere else in, uh, more important than in water and trade, for instance, <clears throat> where at least the civic movements in India have to learn to come to grips with the real problem, not have them swept under the carpet. Because if these problems are not raised, solutions will never be found. And that's why it's important to raise these problems. Now, I'll start with the problem of planning, which is that Planning is a function of power, of different types of power. There are different social solidarities that enjoy different types of power. <coughs> and unfortunately, plan sort of, you know, uh, 
privileges uh, one type of solidarity that is a procedural hierarchic solidarity. And once you get trapped in that mode, there's something called strategic planning which is still valuable. But generally plan is understood to be this massive one big thing that's valid for five years or ten years or whatever. And it is procedural. You follow this now. You know. Things are changing all the time. I mean, give you an example. With uh, climate change, for instance, one thing, the bottom line that comes out of climate change is this, whether you believe in much of it or not, something is happening to our weather, which basically means that the future is definitely not going to be like the past. Very dramatically different is going to be from the past, or the immediate geological past we've experienced, which means that all the hydraulics that we studied in engineering is out of the window. Why? Because we take a series of five or ten dates, data points, a 20-year data point, do our regression analysis and project into the future and say this is a once in a 500-year flood and, or once in a 1,000-year, 10,000-year flood. And this is what we expect. So we design our spillways and our dams and our gates this way. Now, if your future is not going to be like your past, what use are those tools? We probably need new, to new tools, which the hydraulic profession has not come up with yet to do these designs. So one thing is very clear, we are working in a, in a situation of tremendous uncertainty <coughs> added to the social and ecological, somebody mentioned in this meeting yesterday, I think, tremendous, or this afternoon, uh, tremendous uncertainties. Now we have the added uncertainties, the physical uncertainties. We thought at least we knew what nature was all about and what a rock piece was there and where you could dam a river or something. Even that is now getting extremely uncertain. Okay. Now, so we really have to re, uh, go back to uh, rethinking Disappear? What happened? What do you do with this? Just press it again. Unpredictable. See, unpredictable. I guess it'll come back. It's come back. Now, again, what? This one? Ah, yeah, I shouldn't be talking too much. Even the computer went to sleep. <laughs> yeah, so I'll tell you an example on this whole basin issue. Nepal is going through a massive. Uh, audacious experiment of restructuring the state and restructuring the government. Unfortunately, it seems to be ending in a miscarriage. You know. But uh, when this happened, uh, the idea was we're going to have federal units now in place of whatever we had before. And uh, there was a meeting I chaired, uh, organized by the Institute of Foreign Affairs in Kathmandu. And a very bright young divisional engineer was making his presentation. He's now become a joint secretary, the Ministry of Water Resources or the Ministry of Energy. And he was asked a question by a politician who is now, who subsequently became and is currently still our ambassador to China. He asked this young man, he said, oh, Nepal is going for this federal structure. How will you plan your projects and all under the federal system? So this engineer answered, surprisingly for an engineer, very well. He said, you know, you are the politicians, you should tell us what the structure is and we'll plan accordingly after that. No, 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 you are engineers, you deal with water, how will you plan your water in a federal structure? So finally this guy answered, I thought it was a very bright answer. He said, well, if you ask me, and I know that you know what I say is not going to count, but if you ask me, design your federal structure according to river basins, he said, and we in the Ministry of Water Resources will be very happy. You know? <laughs> well, it's not going to happen that way. Because you know, boundaries are often decided by in the Himalayas by rivers, which are insurpassable, and therefore they happen to be boundaries between two regions. And therefore, there will always be conflicts around river basins because they will always be shared by different, you know, administrative and political and ethnic and God knows what else unit around there. Now, when you expand that, even within Nepal, it's going to be a mess, you know. You expand that over the whole Gangetic Basin and you'll end up with compounding the problem. Let me very quickly highlight what are the immediate issues. Now with Nepal, transboundary issue means basically India. Yes, there is China and a huge part of the Arun Basin, actually the Kosi Basin comes actually from in China. And uh, uh, we have had only one encounter with China and it ended up in a, from a bang into a whimper. Uh, nothing really happened on that. When the Arun 3 project was being planned by the World Bank, some of us activists raised this issue and said the Chinese are going to be building the Peng Choi irrigation project on the Arun. That's the main stem of the Kosi. In Bihar. And guess what the Nepali government did? Because the Nepal government by that time, and this is, what is it, 1992, 93, so beholden to donors that 
instead of dealing with the neighbor and the Nepali foreign ministry going and talking with China saying what are you planning there and all, they passed a formally, it sounds comical and silly, but that's what they did. They said, we authorized the World Bank to talk on our behalf with China. Can you believe it? Because the World Bank was the lead agency for this project. Of course, the World Bank never could talk to China. China would never bother to talk to the World Bank. They don't give two hoots about the World Bank. And so eventually, the Chinese just went ahead and built this project. Now, we don't know how much water is being withdrawn in this project. But it means that on the main stem of the Kosi, Darun, uh, water in the dry season could be reduced by as much as 13 to 39 percent, which would reduce our hydroelectric <coughs> flow here. But we have no regime by means of which we can tell China you don't build that project because they will uh, reduce the water downstream. And the same applies between Nepal and India and between India and Bangladesh. I mean, we really don't have any kind of a, a regime in place. Now, with India, this is where because most of the Hima, you know, Nepali <coughs> is south facing, it's mostly with all the rivers practically all of them, are coming into the Ganges. The uh, problem is that India has to be really serious because India is the only country that has a boundary with every other country. And it's every other country that has rivers flowing from them into India and to somewhere else, Bangladesh afterwards. Now, fact of the matter is, and this is a, despite all the talk of SARC and regional cooperation and all that, there is no regional cooperation on water, period. Let's be very clear about it. Mahakali was a bilateral treaty, Faraka was a bilateral treaty. There is no regionalism. India has not accepted regionalism. Uh, I must be the only one who took part in the one last meeting between Nepal, India, Bangladesh in 1986. It's the first and the last one. I was still an engineer within the ministry there those days, and I wrote the minutes, I remember. And it's comical stories about how, how those minutes are written. But there has not been any regionalism. That's the first thing. Now, second thing vis-a-vis -vis Nepal is that, now, I'm, I'm using the word India, but please, my, uh, you know, I keep correcting myself, but I can't, you know, is I try to use the word Delhi hydrocracy. Uh, and because, you know, you're all Indians, and I have no problem with you. you know. <laughs> Most of my, you know, very good friends are activists from India. Uh, but when you use India, everybody bristles and says, oh, you know, it's not you, I mean, I'm talking about Delhi hydrocracy. So let me try to use Delhi hydrocracy, but I'll slip back force of habit, you know, every once in a while. Delhi hydrocracy, dealing with Nepal, does not accept non-power benefits. There was a comical situation in Patna in 1992, I think, when Chitale, the great Chitale, was making a presentation. He was still Secretary of, I think, Water Resources. And he made a presentation on the Karnali, this 10,800 mega dam land on the Karnali. <laughs> where he had a two columns, uh, two big, this thing on the PowerPoint up there, not a PowerPoint, it was transparency slides, those days. And he had power, power benefit for Nepal, irrigation benefit for Nepal, flood control benefit for Nepal. And then for India, power benefit, and then flood control benefit zero, irrigation benefit zero. You're building the, one of the world's highest dams, biggest storage dam there, and to claim that there is no flood control and irrigation benefit at all, zero was this column right down, you know becomes a bit uh, funny and I was one of those who was sitting there, didn't know how to respond to this guy, I mean he's such a big guy there. And I happened to turn the papers that were handed out before the seminar and by, you know, Pashupati Nath's good grace, I just happened to turn to one page, happened to be the paper written by the chief irrigation engineer of Uttar Pradesh. And he had the sentence saying after Karnali Dam is built, you know, Uttar Pradesh will get 16 million acre feet of extra water in the dry season. So I had to get up and say either Chitale Saab, the secretary, is right or his chief engineer is right. It's either zero or 16 million, you know, million acre feet or whatever it is of water. <coughs> Who is right? And that was quite something. But the fact of the matter is there is no acceptance of uh, power and uh, uh, outside of power, non-power benefit. And uh, it means that if you're not even accepting that there are benefits from it, the idea of sharing benefits just doesn't arise. Now this is what has stymied Mahakali, it has stymied Vesethi, it has stymied just about every project in Nepal that was meant to be a uh, discussion uh, on development between Nepal and India. Uh, on the power benefit itself, again there's a problem and Vesethi, which has recently been cancelled by the government of Nepal, uh, is an example. There is a storage project that would create, besides the energy, it would create, uh, provide about 90 cumex of extra water in the dry season. And this would provide irrigation for what, 90,000 by rule of thumb, 90,000 hectares of paddy or about 
250,000 hectares of drip irrigation if you want. Okay. Now that is significant benefit. But then the project has been defined as a power benefit uh, to be developed by an Australian uh, upstart company. Uh, and uh, there was a big fight on this. There were cases being fought. I mean, Mr. Gopal Sivagodi Chintan and his company and all were fighting in the Supreme Court on this. Finally, what happened was because things got so bad that the company had to now move out because nothing is moving. But on the power even, there was a refusal by Delhi Hydrocracy to buy power at more than you know, something like 3 rupees. I mean, I'm not going to get into the decimal points. So. Now, that was interesting, but uh, it turns out, and there was a small notice in the Times of India, which said that government of India, because the power from Nepal is coming so cheap, it's going to be unfair to other Indian developers in India, is going to levy 2 rupees extra on imported power from Nepal. Now, see, look at from the point of view of Nepal. Our governments, in their fit of whatever weakness, allowed these developers to develop power for export to India from Nepal by submerging Nepali villages and doing all kinds of things. Uh, you know, tax-free, VAT-free, everything free. If you're developing for Nepal, it's taxed, it's VATed, it's everything, okay? You do it, it goes to India, and India government charges 2 rupees extra for the developer. So it means essentially Nepal is subsidizing India. Now, this became another big political hot potato issue. Okay. Now, there are hundreds of issues like this, and, and, uh, and additional to that, if Nepal, we have shortage of 14 hours of power cuts a day. If we, let's talk about importing power from India, and uh, it's meant to be uh, 7 rupees. So, it looks rather silly on the part of Nepal to export your own power at 3 rupees and buy back from India at 7 rupees. This becomes, and it's strange that even our politicians never thought of the political consequence of this. And there are several examples of this. The worst part, now this is, some, this is something that we have experienced, but demands further study, especially engagement by Indian civic movements. The distortion of the legal and constitutional provisions in Nepal, directly by involvement of Indian diplomats and Indian officials, has created so much bad blood <coughs> that I just don't see, I just don't foresee anywhere in the near future without these things being corrected of any such collaborative projects being taken up at all. Forget the marks. I mean, recently when GMR's office was burnt down about two months ago, whatever it was, in West Nepal, they got a license to build the Karnali project. The license was acquired by violating the Nepali constitution. Okay. Now, that's on the top level. At the bottom level, the GMR agreement is even worse than the Kosi and Gandak agreement that most Nepalis have been criticizing for the last 50 years. Okay. Because it forbids in Jumla Valley, which is one of the poorest valleys of Nepal, it forbids that Tila River from being used for anything by the local people at all. Because it would impact on the GMR project downstream. Okay. Now this made people so angry that they went down and burned up the project. Now the Maoists are blamed for it. Unfortunately, it's not just the Maoists that would be easy. There were Maoists, but there is Janamorcha there, there are several other parties there, including a very right-wing pro-India party called Rashtriya Jansakti Party. Their colors were also there burning that pro project down. Now, it has come to this point where these issues really have to be looked at. Now, I want to make, a, you know, something that, uh, you know, a, a former Indian, I believe, whatever secretary was, under secretary, whatever, Mr. Kher. He made a statement to my colleague Ajay Dixit immediately after the regime change in Nepal. He said, Dixit sir, our country to tackle ho gaya. Ab hum project to karenge Nepal mein. Aap kya karoge? We are now going to the northeast, you know, in India. That is where the problem is. So, Vijay Bhai, welcome to the club. <laughs> so, so, this is the kind of arrogant attitude and the, and the, uh, of the Delhi hydrocrats of distorting the legal processes in Nepal. Of course, 90, I would say, percent of the blame goes to supine Nepali politicians who agree to this kind of stuff. You know? and so, on the legal side, there are something like 14 committees, subcommittees on standing committees and all kinds of committees between Nepal and India handling everything from flood to power to power exchange to irrigation to everything. All of them are practically dead. <coughs> you know, the last meeting was about the one I believe I held with uh, on SKIP, the Standing Commission on Flood and Inundation, which was 2003. But every other committee is not working. When the water is not released from the Gandhar Canal to the Nepali farmers, the way, only way the Nepali farmer can really have redress is if at the secretary and the standing committee level the meeting is held and they get. Now the crop is drying out 
on the on the on the Kosi Canal or the Ganda Canal, they don't get their water. There is no recourse. So it leads to the current agreements and the patterns of development that we have have got lots to be looked at for their mess. It will not be looked at by the hydro plants, which is why it's so incumbent upon the civic movements to begin to look at these exam to examine these things because there's nobody else. And the media used to look at it, but now media in India has become and in Nepal so corporatized that they will refuse to print these stories even if somebody does it. Only Richard will probably do stories like this, but you know, Richard, you know, he's done some good stories. Okay. Mahakali Treaty, the last one done with so much fanfare, is dead. It's 14 years now. The treaty says that when it was signed in 19, and ratified in 1996, within six months a DPR will be done. 14 years have, been gone, have gone by and not even the DPR is ready and cannot be ready precisely for that uh, thing we saw today. Uh, you made a presentation on that Sian where the water level goes up. The re-regulating reservoir is a big problem about how to do the re-regulating and there are several problems like this associated with it. Now, I won't go into Bangladesh because Bangladesh will talk for themselves, but just mention this one thing. Muchkun Dube, the former then, just finished as foreign, foreign secretary of India, come to Nepal and had argued that why is Nepal arguing for, you know, bringing in Bangladesh at all? You know, India can use all the water and all the power that Nepal can produce, so why bother with Bangladesh at all? And this was a very, very powerful argument made against re multilateral or regionalism at, at all. So this is where the, I'm, I'm just drawing a nutshell, I mean, I could give separate lectures on each one of them. But this is where things stand. And but the question is, who's going to handle it? Now this has to be handled at the level of the civic movements who have alternative value systems, alternative to the hydrocracies. At the international level, I'll just briefly talk about it. But the 1997 UN International Water Force is also dead. Uh, it's expected that it should have been ratified by a minim minimum of 35 countries. I think we've reached only what is this 22 by now. And even though Nepal voted for it, only obstinate country to vote for it, Bangladesh voted for it, but India abstained, China uh, voted against, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, what the Nepalese are now expecting is that it will die its natural death, because the vote was cast by somebody not authorized to cast the vote, and there's a long story about it. I can tell you over here. Uh, on regional arrangements, there's a lot of talk about Mekong. You know, Mekong, yes, Mekong people are doing far better than we South Asians, way, way, way better. But there's a hell of a lot of problems there. I was on the panel of experts with the Mekong River Commission looking at their basin plan. Same problem they're having. Their basin plan completely was, uh, it, it was a cement plan. You know, it was about how to build dams. Okay. It was not a plan about how to manage the basin. So much so that the strategic <coughs> plan of the Mekong River Commission contradicted the basin plan completely. The strategic plan outlined is the richest fisheries in the world, Mekong, by the way. And much of the Mekong people depend on fisheries for their protein. It turns out that if you build some of the mainstream dam, they will stop the nutrient flow of silt, which means the fisheries in the Mekong, uh, the Vietnam Delta will be wiped out, plus along the Mekong. And the calculation is that Mekong fisheries are much richer than the Amazon or West African fisheries right now. Now, by building the mainstream dam, 11 of them proposed, what you would do is you'd wipe out the fisheries as rich as Amazon or the uh, West African one. And for what? If all the 11 dams were built on the mainstream, they would provide electricity equivalent to one year of growth of electricity demand between Vietnam and Thailand in 2022 20, when this would be complete. Would you sacrifice the entire river, fisheries of your river for one year's electricity growth between Vietnam and Thailand? Now, that was asked by the strategic plan, but the basin plan completely ignored it and said, you know, we can go ahead and do the thing. So Laos went ahead and notified the Sayaburi Dam, and now all hell has broken loose in the Mekong. So it's not that you have a functioning thing like the Mekong River Commission and it still works. It doesn't work, you know. So my argument, and this is where I'll come down to the latter closing part of my uh, remarks, is that are we barking up the wrong tree with this whole thing about planning and, you know, plans and then and, and commissions and basin commissions. It's like this in Nepal. When the National Human Rights Commission was being set up, I remember arguing with the two big human rights wallas from two different kind of groups, Kapil Shrestha and Subodh Sushit Gagnar. And I said, okay, you guys are arguing for a formation of a human rights commission. My, my concern is that, you know, well, some of you might be members. Both of them ended up becoming, I think, members of the commission afterwards. But human rights itself is going to be dead. There will be no human rights activism after that. 
So by doing this basin thing, are we trapping ourselves into, you know, water alternative use and activism being dead or domesticated to such an extent that you're completely domesticated and useless? No. Or are we going to keep space? It's not to say, let's not do planning or let's not engage with the government. On the contrary, let's keep engaging. The key word is engaging. But it means not getting domesticated to the extent that you're completely intellectually just smothered off. Right? The Rhine story is an important one. I like to mention this because the Rhine is a great example of a failure at a basin planning level and success at an overall basin level. Rhine was the sewer of Europe. No, no river in the world has ever been polluted like the Rhine because it went through the industrial heartland of Europe where industrial heartland really started. Okay? And it was really bad. In 1963, in 1963, the idea of a Mekong Commission was first mooted but it, uh, in 50, but it really got official in 1963. Till, 1963. Rhine. The Rhine. The Rhine. Yeah. Said Mekong. Ah, sorry, the Rhine. Yeah. 1976, the first agreement convention on the Mekong was done and nothing really happened. They were arguing about nuts and bolts, you know, like in the UN, uh, United Nations thing about how many nuts and bolts a tank should have. It was going nowhere until the Sandal spill happened in 1986, November 1. Okay. That galvanized a lot of action and this is where it's interesting. Several things happened. You had a very interesting Dutch minister because they were like the Bangladesh minister at the end of the <laughs> Delta. And they were the ones where all the gunk was going to come through. She got, she looked and she said, there is this Rhine Commission and it's not going anywhere. If I rely on the Rhine Commission, I'm not going to get anywhere. Okay? What she did was she got a bunch of very smart people and said, tell me what is it I can do outside of the Rhine Commission. Let the Rhine Commission be there and continue doing it. But what can I do? This commission is asked for four things and she implemented those four things. First thing she said is, you can have, you should have intergovernmental agreements in informal and non-binding. Now this goes against all our thinking. What's the point of an informal agreement? You know? But said so no, get informal agreements among the countries, but don't make it so procedurally binding that you know countries will really be arguing with each other about nuts and bolts. Okay? Second was against formal treaties. Said so don't bother to do formal treaties. You know, have verbal agreements that are public, okay, uh, to reach standards on. Third thing, put the responsibility of implementing these things at the lowest level of governance, which was the cantons and the landers, or what would be the equivalent of districts in India. You know? Get work done there. Okay? And finally, the fourth thing was that government regulations should be absolutely minimum, confined to standards, and they did only two things. They enunciated the goal. They said, we will eliminate 15 of the worst toxics from the Mekong Basin within the right. seven years. Right. Right. I'm right. sorry, Mekong, Rhine. Right. Right. Keep shifting with it too. In the Rhine. Could you say that because people are awake that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing they said, which sounded comical and there were cartoons about it in those days, in 1986. They said, we will make sure that the salmon returns to the Rhine. So this toxic sewer, you want the salmon back there? Are you joking? But those are the two things that the government's intergovernmental agreement was verbal, saying we'll do that. Get rid of the 15 worst ones and get salmon back. Well, they got the salmon back now. And they've eliminated those toxics way ahead of schedule. Why? Because the, all the work was done at the lowest level of government. It was done not just by the lowest level of government, it was done by businesses in those cantons, together with activists, environmentalists getting together and working. You know? which has lessons for us, which shows that we can probably need to rethink our plan about how to save the Ganges or how to save any of the other rivers on similar models. If we rely only on plans, national plans and national government authorities, I'm afraid we're going to be you know, even earlier than where the Mekong people were. Why is it? Because what I'm trying to argue with you is that we are too prone and this is one argument I have with IRN and your plan that you have circulated to all of us. Samir, where are you? Yeah. Uh, it's not got enough stuff about It's too elegant. And elegant, we always have elegant failures. What we need are clumsy successes. Okay? And because water problems are wicked problems, wicked problems are those that we cannot even properly define. And they cannot be solved with conventional knowledge comfortable knowledge that we've been taught in schools and universities. We need uncomfortable knowledge. Unfortunately, uncomfortable knowledge tends to be filtered out. Okay? 
And it's only uncomfortable knowledge that provides us with clumsy solutions. Messy, clumsy, negotiated. Somebody said you shouldn't watch sausages being made and politics being made, you know. These clumsy solutions are political solutions at those local levels where, you know, sometimes very messy sort of agreements have been done. Well, let it be and let it move forward. It's not 100% perfect, but it is something to move on. Okay. Now, I won't go into details of causal theory, but this is where we argue that there are four types of water generated by four different social solidarities. You know, it's hierarchism that argues for resource scarcity and produces public goods like piped water, irrigated water through canals controlled by babus and so on and so forth. Okay? But regulation is the key word. Market individualism, on the other hand, argues for resource abundance and is private goods. Bottled water, tanker water, you name it, motorized pumps, individual, that's it. What social sciences have forgotten is the other diagonal, which is egalitarianism, which is where most activists and others come from, which argue for common pool goods common water for, that belongs to everybody, spiritual water, you name it, aesthetic water, etc., which they fight for, which market doesn't fight for and hierarchy doesn't fight for. And finally, you have fatalism. This is the mass of average voters who have believe in resource lottery and it's club goods for them because they do not belong to the club and they are excluded from it. Okay. But what is important is what this shows, if you start applying this, now this is applied to some of the stuff in Nepal and groundwater, but more important to Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, I think, where you have the water table declining. And you find out that the social response to groundwater overdraft comes as per cultural theory's predictions, that you have four responses. You, know, you have the market wallers who have, or people who have money, who buy the latest pump and go deeper and deeper and, you know, hell with the neighbors, you know, as long as I can do it, what the heck. You have the angry activist, you know, who doesn't like the government and doesn't like the market and all that, and is fulminating to do something. You have the village patwari type, you know, who says we should frame rules and regulations. Now, what cultural, and then you have the fatalist, you know, Bhagwan Maroshi, you don't know what to do. Now, what cultural theory is arguing is each of these positions are irreconcilable, but they are, it's possible to engage between them. So this morning we had a lot of this discussion about engaging. So if we can get a policy terrain which is democratic, where there is not, people are not only listened to but also responded to. You can have a democratic terrain where everybody is talking and nobody is listening and that's not too good either. But talking and getting responded, then you end up with what I call a three-legged policy stool. But to show you that that example works not just in groundwater in India, but it also works for climate change at the global level. Clumsy, wicked problems do not have easy definition. What is the climate change problem? You find out that even the definition of the problem is different. You know, bureaucracies would see it as population, too much population, too many Chinese and too many Indians control them and that's it, you know. Markets would say more Chinese, more Indians means more consumers. What's the problem? It's not a problem, you know. So you can sell more. The problem is controls, remove the controls, give us freedom to sell what we like and we'll, we'll, we'll invent our way out of the problem, okay. And finally, you have the social auditors or activists and to them, profligacy is the problem. We are too greedy. You know, we are riding SUVs when we should be riding bicycles, okay? Now, each one of them is defining the climate problem very differently. Now, if your definition of the problem is different, your solution, you bet your boots, is going to be even more different, right? Now, what culture theory is arguing is that we should be able to provide that space. I'll give you this example from Nepal on a river on the, called the Tinau on the Rohini. Uh, uh, Rohini is the one river uh, which Buddha medi mediated the first world's water conflict that uh, we know it's between here where he was born and where his mother's house was. Okay. Now, brushwood dams. 80% of Nepal's hilly, hilly irrigation is actually met from brush brushwood dams. And we have professors from IIT here and other places, you know. Any engineering college in India or anywhere in the world, you know, or at least in our region that teaches about brushwood dams, we are taught cement technologies. So when the farmers here had problems because the market is under pressure, it's built on voluntarism and you know, if you get 200 rupees working in a town, why would you work three days volunteer for this thing? You know, so there's a tendency to cheat. Managers of these brushwood systems are having a tough time, so they want some help. Their kind of help is they may need a small backhoe to minimize labor use or they may need plastic sheets. Or, I mean, it's not environmentally good, but what the hell. Or cement stakes instead of uh, bamboo, which they can't find, you know, which they can remove. I mean, these are disposable dams, environmentally very friendly. Come the monsoon, they are washed off. Nobody needs them. The Bangladesh must have tons of these things also. Okay. But they come to the government, and because government is peopled by people like me, with fancy degrees from um, civil engineering or whatever from somewhere, you know, 
we are only taught cement technology. So on that same river, they put up this dam. I'd like to blame the World Bank for it, but unfortunately, huh. this happened long before the World Bank. It was 1961 it was built. And it was built by the government of India. And I should say this in Delhi. Yeah? It was built in 61, and in 1962, the river moved away. And that dam is still standing there. You go south of Butwal, you see that dam. On the, it's called the Hakisunde Baraj. Standing there as a monument to man's stupidity or arrogance or whatever you call it. And the river has moved away. Now that's the comedy part of it. The tragedy part of it is that down below where it was supposed to irrigate, it's an area called Marchawar in Nepal. It's got a significant Muslim population. And this is one of the regions which has a significant thing. Very poor area. The land was, you know, they had the Warabandi sort of system with patchwork, you know, fields and all that where water sharing was done this year, you first, next year, you last, you know, that sort of stuff, you know. They carved it up into New York grid type of canal system. And so they destroyed the whole system. So what happened? The dam didn't function because the river moved away. The old system had been carved up and destroyed, which was done by uh, the brushwood dams. So the area collapsed, socially collapsed into a duckoid infested area for 20 years as people had to do anything to survive. And it took 20 years and guess what the salvation was? Among other things, it was that humble Kiroskar pump. That area is floating in groundwater. Right? So you can dip, put a bamboo stake inside in 10 feet and you'll get water. Right? Okay? So the pump came and in everybody's backyard, we started whoever could afford put a pump. If you couldn't afford to buy a pump, you could rent one for 50 rupees an hour on a bullock cart. And the area started reviving itself. Look at the technological choices, the three different technological choices done by these three different social solidarities, as I call them. Community system in one, big hierarchy government system by another that chooses big technologies, invariably cement and large thing. And finally, the market, you know, whether it's bottled water, pumped water, tanker water, come on, as long as you have money, you go ahead and do it. Okay. All three have space. What cultural theory argues is that it's not just one. It's all three. Okay? If you provide space to all three, to bureaucratic hierarchism with one form of risk assessment is risk managing, to market individualism, which is a risk taking, and to activist egalitarianism, which is risk sensitizing, they provide different technical solutions. They see the problem differently, and they provide their own different solutions. You provide that space, and you provide what we call space for many 10% solutions. It's not this one perfect, you know, this master plan for Kathmandu Valley water supply through a 30 kilometer tunnel of Melanchi. It's maybe that's right 20 years from now when the tunnel is built, but what about doing some toilet fixing and having three liter toilet instead of 15? How about doing some water recycling? What about some water harvesting? Each one might provide you only about 10%, 12% solutions. Some might not work. Do 20, 10% solutions. And they can be done some by communities, some by individuals, some by some. You have all this, you add up 20, 10% solution, you will not get 200, but you are closer to getting your 100% solution right away. So this leads me to close by asking that uh, what we have done with basin planning is this wrong idea that there is this one perfect plan that these basin plans will do, and we pursue that chimera, and we'll achieve nirvana. We will not get it. At best, what we should do, and to answer Vijay's question, is not to give up planning, for heaven's sake. It's not to give up engaging with the government. We should engage even more. But to argue only for strategic visioning like the Rhine, Rhine people did, saying, okay, we'll get the salmon back on the Rhine. They say, okay, we'll make the Ganga clean, and uh, you can do a Sechen, and the Panditji can even you know, drink that water directly from the Ganga in another 15 years time. You know? In Stockholm, the lake there was so polluted, there was, the mayor made a statement that I will drink the water of this lake when it's clean, you know. And now it's become a ritual in Stockholm that the mayor of Stockholm, when he takes office, takes a glass of water and drinks it from that lake, which was a sewer before. Okay. It can be done. But it can be done only if we go for pluralism, if we go for many 10% solutions, if we go for a role for each one of them that is not to the exclusion of either the market or the activist or the governmental side. So I think this is where our planning has to look for, and this is where our transboundary approach also must begin to look for. Thank you. Thank you.